Hey guys, it's Edbert. In today's video, I'll be demonstrating how I come up with examples and test cases to build my code from the ground up. We'll be going over two problems to demonstrate the principles that I have outlined in my last video. If you haven't seen that, I'll post that up here. The primary thing I want to look at today is coverage, specifically how we identify and create enough test cases to ensure that we cover all the scenarios that our code can run into. We will also look at how we might come up with efficient testing so that in a 40 minute interview, you can provide the fewest number of test cases to cover your idea. In this way, you're forced to write your code around these tests the same way you might for test driven development. By doing this, we will be able to set ourselves up for accurate problem solving and bulletproof code. Now, I know this might sound like a very long, painful and unnecessary process, but once you actually get proficient at it, it only takes two to three minutes to actually do it. And potentially, it will save you about 20 minutes of troubleshooting your idea and code if you were to run into a bug. And I'm going to show you how to do all this. So if you like my work and want to support me, please donate to my Kofi. Link in the description down below. Also, please like, subscribe, and watch this until the very end. It lets me know that you like what I do here and you want to see more content like this. And if you connect with me on my socials, you can vote for what topic I cover next. So with that, welcome to the coding interview. You suck. So let's start with our first problem. Given a 2D grid of maps of ones and zeros, ones representing land and zeros representing water, count the number of islands. An island is surrounded by water and is formed by connecting adjacent lands horizontally or vertically. You may assume all four edges of the grid are surrounded by water. Now I'll give you a few minutes to solve this problem, but chances are you've probably seen and solved this problem before. But the key I want you to focus on this time is to prove that your answer is complete. Pause the video here if you need to. Okay, welcome back. Now, this problem is a very simple DFS problem, but the question is, how do you prove it? And how do you create test cases such that you can prove that not only your solution works, but it's also complete? To start, our solution is gonna look something like this. Loop through the entire matrix. If we find a land, increment the number of islands by one and visit all adjacent squares. For the adjacent squares, remove the lands for consideration and remove the lands tangential to those and so on. Looping over every matrix square is pretty easy and straightforward to understand. But the code of interest is this recursive part of the algorithm where we go to remove additional squares. So to pass validation, we have three cases, a single water that is in bounds, a single land that is in bounds, and a square that is out of bounds. Okay, that's cool. But remember from our last video, how we can break down a state into subsequent states. If we want to test our recursion, we can break down number two into a land that has a land next to it, a land that has a water next to it, or a land that has an out of bounds square next to it. Keep in mind the subsequent squares can be above, below, to the left, and to the right. So really, if you wanted to be absolutely bulletproof, you could create four test cases for each of these three scenarios. Now, why did I pick these? Because these are all the possible cases that we can run into. But having a water square or out of bounds square cannot make a subsequent function call. So we don't need to progress any further or look at their tangential squares. But wait, what about every cardinal direction? Should we not include a permutation for every direction that we investigated? Really, it's a trivial matter to do that because you're just adding plus or minus one to your X and Y positions. So I would argue there's almost no need for it. And this is where the magic of being efficient at creating your test cases comes in. You will slowly recognize which test cases you need to be worried about and which you do not. You want your test cases to capture the most important parts of your algorithm. In our case, the fact that we iterate through the four cardinal directions is not very interesting. But what is interesting is the conditions under which we will recurse. The reason I'm telling you all this is because I see a lot of people trying to cram a bunch of test cases into one master test case. The big problem with it is that it does too much. It hits too many cases at once. And usually you should only do this once you're very comfortable with creating test cases at a detailed and basic level. And while you might argue that a compact example is needed to save time and space on the whiteboard, the fact of the matter is that the more complex your test case is, the more mistakes you hide and that are not immediately obvious. In this particular example, it hides the fact that it does not test the condition that land is next to out of bounds. In fact, if you try to build your code off of this, it effectively asks you to look at sub matrices of these to handle each individual condition, which is effectively just separate test cases anyway. 
What is even worse is that when I tell people that the solution is not enough or that their test case is not enough, people try to resolve it by just sprinkling more land around or something akin to this. So if we really want to be fancy and do what you guys really want to do and make an efficient test case, I would suggest actually looking at all these conditions holistically and merging them into one example. For instance, it might look something like this. This is better than our previous example, but it's still not optimal. Why is that? Because there are extraneous spaces that contribute nothing. Look at the fourth row and fourth column. Having water next to another water square or having it out of bounds means absolutely nothing to us. We get no better information or debugging information by drawing extra water squares. In this case, we can actually take our prime example and remove the fourth row and fourth column. And voila, our example actually becomes much more compact and still tests every single condition we want to. And yet, I still don't recommend doing this. So, why did I spend all this time explaining to you how to compact your test case when I don't think you should be doing it? Because I want to prove a point here. That simple test cases should build up complex ones, not the other way around. And that if your test case ends up being a little bit too complicated, chances are you probably missed a state or a condition that you need to test. Okay, well, that was a very simple problem. Let's actually try another one for good measure. And this time, I want you to be very cognizant of the test cases that you need to use to prove this. So, given a non-empty string s and a dictionary word dict, determine if s can be segmented into a space-separated sequence of one or more dictionary words. Try this one on your own first. What do you think would constitute good test cases and why? I'll pause it here so you can try it. Okay, you back? Cool. The basic algorithm is actually very simple. We start at the start of the word and iterate through every word in the dictionary. If there is a match, we will advance the pointer by that word's length and continue to recurse. If we make it to the end of the string, we will set a global flag and return that. Now class, what do you think are the conditions we need to achieve to complete coverage? Well, our states approximately break down into this. The string either exists in a dictionary or it does not. And underneath that, if there's even more of the string that we need to look at or if there isn't. So then, we can come up with effectively these test cases in order to test each one of these conditions here. The example with wolf and dog tests the condition that the string does not match anything in the word dictionary. Cats and cats just tests a very simple happy case here where cats can be found in the word dictionary and completes the string. Of course, we also want to test our recursion. So we do cats, dogs, with our word dict being cats, dogs as well. We should also test the failure case in this recursive case, where we have our dictionary be cats, rabbits instead. Finally, what happens when we have an empty string and we don't match anything in the word dictionary? So because we tr are trying to test our combination of matching and not matching and whether or not there is a recursive case, this naturally leads us to ask the interviewer if an empty string is valid or not. This is up to interpretation, but this weird edge case just comes naturally as a consideration of the coverage. You should use these test cases to build up your code in the same way you might for test-driven development. Look at this, let's actually try and write the code for this. So it might look something like this. Now, of course, this if condition is not really going to stay there, but it's really just there as a placeholder. But this just gives us a start to build off of. Let's take our next two test cases, cats, dogs, with word dictionary cats and dogs, and cats dogs with word dictionary cats and rabbits. Remember, our termination condition is when we've reached the end of the string and there's no more string to actually look at. And voila, we've just created our code. Hopefully this gives you an insight into how I think about my test coverage and proving my answer. I start with a general algorithm or roadmap of what I want to do, and then come up with test cases to cover all the scenarios that my loop or recursion will run into. In this way, I can prove to my interviewer that my algorithm does work. However, you do need to be very careful when writing the code. If you end up writing the code very sloppily, patching your code and debugging it, and ignoring all the test cases that you have written, then all the things that you've done up to this point have been fairly meaningless. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Also, if you want to try and secure that next job offer for your upcoming technical interview, you can book me at echantech.com for some interview coaching. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.